The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our risk assessment software webinar. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the Hippie Survival Guide. And I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. My uh, co-panelist today is my better half, Deborah Leva. She'll be joining in uh, on the discussion. And as always, our Director of, Martin, uh, Director of Operations, Martin Gwynn, will be trolling the chat um, for questions. We'll, we will take questions as we go, uh, which is our normal procedure. And then we'll take questions at the end as well. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. We're going to review learning objectives, a little bit of background, talk about risk assessment software in various uh, components or categories, if you will, the vocabulary, the methodology, timing, responsible parties, and then compare and contrast products. So the learning objectives, we want to provide a foundational understanding of risk assessment software under the HIPAA security rules. So um, although we'll be talking about uh, risk assessment software sort of in general, in this particular case, it, it's going to be how it applies to the HIPAA security rule and what you ought to be seeing if you're purchasing risk assessment software for the express purpose of doing a HIPAA security rule risk assessment. So we're going to uh, talk about the lingo a methodology that's agile, repeatable, and verifiable, the timing, the responsible parties, compare and contrast. But what we want to do is leave organizational stakeholders with a sense with the sense of the due diligence that you should perform in order to select HIPAA risk assessment software. So although the risk assessment is an implementation specification of the security rule, there are some overlaps where uh, you should treat uh, breach notification and privacy rule issues within a risk assessment. So um, it is more comprehensive than just the security rule in certain particular uh, areas, which touch the privacy rule and touch the breach notification rule. Of course, your your um, your goal is always to build a better compliance story, a better compliance narrative by getting better and better at um, coming up with visible demonstrable evidence that you're meeting the requirements, right? You need, you need processes, you need policies, plus processes, plus tracking mechanisms that allow you to track process results so that you can build a better compliance story at the granularity level of a requirement. The requirement today that we're focused on is a HIPAA risk assessment. That is one of the requirements. It's actually one of the 29 controls uh, to use more modern lingo of the security rule. It's the second implement. It's the first implementation of the first standard of the administrative safeguards. So, let's quickly review some vocabularies. A lot of you have se seen this before. I'm not going to read it to you. I may select key pieces here. When we talk about an asset, normally an asset is a thing tangible or intangible that uh, accesses, stores, maintains, or transmits EPHI. So the um, examples are networks, PCs, servers, mobile devices, information systems. But you also have things like buildings, your workforce, applications. So you have some abstractions that are not physical things. These are all assets, and in our methodology, we call them security objects. And the reason we call them security objects is because they're broader than just what people tend to think of as an asset. OK, the software that we're going to be talking about today is should be based on the gold standard that uh, NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology has developed for federal government agencies uh, describing the manner by which a risk assessment ought to be conducted. Okay? Now, as everyone knows, the HIPAA regulations don't tell you how to do things, but the Secretary from time to time will provide you guidance. And the Secretary has consistently pointed to the NIST document 
SP 800-30 Rev 1 as being the gold standard by which risk assessments ought to be conducted. Okay, so that caveat emptor: if your vendor is conducting a risk assessment um, and and is not using the gold standard and is substituting something like a survey or a questionnaire or something like that and calling it a risk assessment, uh, you may find out that it's not a risk assessment when HHS comes calling or a court of law comes calling. Okay, so that's one of the things to be uh, careful about. Okay, although it's not required to use that NIST methodology, that's what this that's what the guidance points to, and you better believe that you better be doing something as good as that or better. Okay, so um, that particular methodology deals with. And I'm going to get just to the to the meat of it. It deals with risks, okay? And risk is defined as the net mission impact, considering the probability that a particular threat will exercise, accidentally trigger, or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability. And if that were to occur, what's the resulting impact to your organization? Okay, it's based on a kind of equation that we're going to talk about. So it's the probability of T exploiting V, and if that were to occur, what would it mean to your organization? For example, if you had no redundant power supply and Katrina uh, struck, the impact to your organization would be catastrophic. And so you need to match threat vulnerability pairs and then calculate an impact before you can set a risk level. Okay, and a risk assessment is a process by which an organization identifies the following things that we're talking about. Threats, vulnerabilities, the harm, which is the impact, and the likelihood that that harm will occur. Okay, that's all risk. Now, risk management happens to be the second implementation specification of the first standard of the administrative safeguards. It, and for all intents and purposes, it just swallows almost the entirety of the HIPAA security rule. The risk assessment implementation specification uh, is your risk assess is your security rule uh, HIPAA compliance initiative? Okay, it, it it encompasses almost everything. Why? Because it starts with a risk assessment, and then it says you have to simplify. Okay, because maybe you can't attack all the risks that you've identified, and then you have to implement those controls that you identified in your risk assessment that will reduce risks, the ones you decided to attack the levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, et cetera. And then you need to monitor how those controls are doing. You just can't implement. It's not set and forget. You just can't implement them and walk away. You have to monitor how well they're doing. You have to report out both internally and, uh, God forbid, if you get audited or you get sued externally. And then what do you do? You assess again. So it's, it's this repeating life cycle. Okay, risk mitigation is what you do to try to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Okay, so security controls, all right, and we shorten this and we just call them controls, okay. Those are the management, operational, and technical controls, safeguards prescribed for an information system to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of a system and then its PHI. Now, here's the thing, is that HIPAA was prom first promulgated, first uh, promulgated in 1996 under President Clinton, okay? It didn't go into effect until 2004 and 2005. They were using outdated terminology. If you can imagine 1996, that was like when the internet was just first getting started, they probably borrowed some, you know, CIA specification for information system uh, security as a starting point, and instead of calling implementation specifications controls, which is really what they are, they call them implementation specifications. Nobody uses that term anymore except for the HIPAA security rule. So we don't use it either. It, you know, well, in Expresso, we don't use it either. You implement controls, but it turns out that every implementation specification all 29 of them in the security rule are a type of control, okay? And that's really, really important because if the vendor
vendor that you choose is not identifying the security rule implementation specifications as controls, then you may have done a risk assessment and it may be helpful to you, but it's not helpful to you with respect to complying with the security rules. Why? Because it doesn't identify those controls that you need to implement. You know, if you completely leave out, leave out some, all, or, or you know, or a part of the controls that the security rule specifies, then by definition, you're not going to be in compliance with the security rule. Okay, so that's why we, we again, we said that we we call we don't use the term assets. We use security objects, operations, because it includes operations, individuals, assets, applications, a much broader term, okay? What is a threat? A threat is the potential for a person or thing to exercise, accidentally trigger, or intentionally expo exploit a specific vulnerability. Weather is a threat. Social engineering and intrusion is a threat. You can go on and on and in the wild, there's probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of threats. Okay, we for Espresso, we broke that down to a smaller number of threats, uh, and we essentially aggregated them. And then this methodology says that you can aggregate threats and risks, and because that's the only way you can practically deal with uh, hundreds of thousands of threat vectors. That's an impossibility. So for example, we have a threat that says social engineering or intrusion, which means somebody got into your network. They either hacked into your network or they used some phishing scheme to get into your network. That's a threat. That, that particular threat is aggregated. There could be 100,000, 200,000, a million vectors by which somebody could get into your network. But what we're concerned with is Okay, assume that there's a threat out there that lets somebody get into your network, then what are you going to do and which vulnerabilities can this threat vector exploit? Okay? Now, we're willing to take questions at any time. We're covering a lot of heady material, and so if you want to uh, ask a question, just, just put it in the chat session. But we talked about the threat landscape. Go ahead, Martin. I was just going to say, we don't have any questions yet. Okay, what's the vulnerability? A flaw or weakness in the system procedure design implementation or internal controls that could be exercised. Here, it turns out that every implementation specification in the security rule is a vulnerability. So we, we took this matter, antimatter. I'm going to give you an example of it, okay? If, it's, if, the, if the security rule says you should implement a disaster recovery plan, which it does, okay? and you don't have one, then not having one is a vulnerability, okay? If the security rule says you should implement a contingency plan, emergency contingency plan, and you don't have one, then that becomes a vulnerability. And that we took that process and matched them up with threat vectors to sort of come up with 150 risks. Now, not only did we come up with 150 risks, but those 150 risks all implicate one or more of the 29 implementation controls, implementation specifications, i.e. controls that you have to implement in order to be compliant with the HIPAA security rule. Now, of course, there are many more risks that you can identify and add, right? And then obviously Espresso and any other software that that attempts to play in this space should let you add your own risk. The important thing is that we've covered all 29 controls. That means that if you do a risk assessment with Espresso, it's valid by definition because by definition it's, it's already identified those 29 controls. And remember that a risk assessment is only an analysis step. It's not a doing step. The doing is risk mitigation. Okay, so you, you, you identify those 29 controls and you know that at a minimum you have to go implement those 29 controls if you're going to claim to be in compliance with the HIPAA security rule. And we took both addressable and required. We didn't, we didn't make a distinction, okay? We got all of them and we said this is what you need to do. 
Okay, so this is the gold standard. This is what I want you to take away. Take away nothing else. NIST SP800-30 Rev1. That is the standard. That's the standard that everybody that I know of in the industry who has done anything with software has referred to. That's when when HHS has issued guidance, that's what they point to, okay? So, and this is this is a specialized way that you should think about how you conduct a risk assessment, okay? But before we get there, what are we what are we trying to do? What is this all this talk about a risk assessment? Yeah, we know we, you got to comply, but practically, what is it that you're trying to do other than just satisfy Big Brother? What we're trying to do is we're trying to Katrina proof your practice. Essentially, from a practical perspective, should Katrina strike strike tomorrow, would your practice survive? That's one question that you have to ask. Okay, and as you go through this, you'll realize that the security rule in the 21st century is something that you just have to do to conduct business. We're no longer right in the horse and buggy stage, right? We're in this 365, 24-7 world, lots of bad guys out there. This is, this is IT 101. As complex as the security rule may seem, and everybody that's ever attacked it for the first time understands its complexity. It's still IT 101. It's still cost of doing business and doing the 20 in the 21st century, and you're just, we're just not going back. No, no, no election is going to make us go back. There's nothing that's going to make us go back. This is just the nature of the world that we live in. Okay. <laughs> Beyond that, the security rule does not require the impossible. Okay. What we're trying to do is to reduce, not eliminate risk. Notice this is language that comes out of the rule. Not eliminate all risk. That's an impossibility. We're trying to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Again, okay, reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually codified, okay, in 164.306. Those are the general principles or the general rules for the security rule. Okay? It's called the flexibility principle. It's built into the rule. Now you need to understand that, that a security rule uh, implementation is really a, um, it's a change project. It, you know, if you're not changing the way you think about security, if you're not changing the organizational DNA around how you approach this, if you're just approaching this as some government requirements, some necessary evil, you kind of miss the whole boat. First of all, you're likely to fail. Because most technology projects fail because of people and process challenges. And security rule implementation and the HIPAA compliance initiative in general is a huge people process challenge, right? You have to get everybody's buy-in. You may not have enough financial resources. You may have some old grumpy doc that doesn't want to do it. I mean, you have all kinds of organizational challenges in front of you. And security rule implementation, therefore, is more aptly described as a change project. And learning how to conduct a, an effective risk assessment, that's a big part of that change. That's change 101. That's foundational. Everything else that you do in a security rule, everything else is based on whether or not you can conduct a valid risk assessment. That's the starting point, okay? And what we advocate is having an iterative method methodology because you're going to be conducting risk assessments, we say, at a minimum, once a year. You really should be doing them once a quarter. By law, you need to do it anytime there's a material change in the law, anytime you, there's a material change in your operational environment. What's an example of a material change in your operational environment? Moving. You move from this building to that building, and you don't do a risk assessment, and you don't account for all the tapes, and you don't account for all the boxes of PHI that you have, and you have to leave some behind or leave some in the, in the closet, you're going to be subject to millions of dollars worth of fine. And those are two examples that are already happened. I'm not making it up. Okay? The TRICARE example, about three or four years ago, they left a bunch of these old tapes. And they said, ah, the bad guys can't read those tapes. It's like, nope, sorry, the bad guys can. They're smart. They can read. They'll figure out how to read those tapes. Okay. Recently, somebody left a bunch of boxes when they moved. When you move, if you move, that's a material change in your operational environment, and by law, you have to conduct a risk assessment. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about agile methodology, but this encompasses it here. Fail forward fast. That means get started. 
the biggest thing that you want other than conducting a valid risk assessment with your software is the fact that that software ought to help you climb the literacy curve. You ought to be a lot smarter about a risk assessment when you're done than when you got started. Okay? And we know from experience working with our customers, and we say you can do with Espresso a risk assessment in three hours or less. We'll tell you why as we go on. But the other thing that you get is you get a lot of understanding. Your education level, your literacy level, after you go through that first risk assessment is up by an order of magnitude. You finally will click as to what a valid risk assessment really is under NIST SP 800-30 Rev 1. And look, you don't, under, you don't even have a clue as to what you're doing until you get started. And that's why fail forward fast makes sense. Make some mistakes, get started, and that's how you're going to learn. You fail forward fast. Why? Because it's the only way to attack a wicked problem. And we're not saying wicked is evil. We're saying as wicked as hard. A risk assessment is hard primarily because it has organizational complexity. Okay? Yes, it has a fair amount of technical complexity. But first of all, you don't understand the problem until you start developing the solution. We've seen this time and again. When our customers finally you know, go through their first risk assessment and that light comes on, then they get it. Okay, then their world changes because now they understand how they can hug this monster. Okay, but until they get started, they got all these terms running around their head: threats, vulnerabilities, risk, impact, etc. For a wicked problem, there's no stopping rule. Since there's no definitive problem, there can't be any definitive solution. Anybody that's looked at the regulations knows that they're descriptive, not prescriptive. They tell you what you should comply with, but not how. And even if you go to the NIST documents on how to implement the security rule, all they do is play 20 questions with you. For every requirement, they say, these are the 20 questions that you should be asking. Well, look, if you're just getting started, maybe that's helpful. Well, when I was looking at that, you know, nine years ago, and I'm like, 20 questions, I, I need answers. I don't need another 20 questions per requirement. There is no how-to. In, in, in those guidelines, okay? They play, the, and, and, and from the government, this is something, this is a subtle point, but the government is never going to give you the how-to because then you would make the argument, well, we did it exactly like you said, and now you're saying we're not in compliance, right? No, they're too much too smart for that. They're never going to give you the how-to, okay? So for a wicked problem, solutions are not right or wrong. They're just better than others or worse or good enough, and you're going to find that that's true in the risk assessment space and in everything you do vis-a-vis -vis your HIPAA compliance initiative. Every wicked problem is unique and novel. Your implementation of the security rule of risk assessments or risk mitigation is going to be different than the next organizations because each organization is different. The cultures are different. The resources are different, okay? And every solution is a one-shot operation. What do we mean by that? Well, it matters the kind of methodology that you pick. If you if you think that this is a set and forget big bang project that you do step one, step two, step three, and you know then you're done, you're going to discover that that's not the way it works. Okay, you do step one, and then you learn something. And you say, oh wait, 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 wait. Now we got to go back to step one again because we're a little smarter now. We're going to do step one and two. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we got step one better, but it wasn't good enough. And so you're going to iterate through this thing, okay? You're going to iterate through this thing to finally get a solution. And then you're going to implement a methodology that helps you mitigate, okay? And this is our summary of the NIST methodology is, believe it or not, the second implementation specification of the first administrative safeguard standard includes a risk assessment. They split it out into two. I don't know why, maybe to highlight that this is a recursive evergreen process, but this is the entirety of your program. You assess, you simplify, because maybe you can't attack all the risks you identified at the same time. You protect, which means you implement the controls that you identify. You monitor how well those controls are reducing risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. You report to your executive management team on how you're doing, and then you reassess. And you keep doing this over and over and over across time. Okay, So it turns out that big problems require 
many, many, many small solutions. That's the only way you can solve them. The best advice we can give you is to get started. Pick an agile methodology, get started, make some mistakes, and then learn. Okay, so I'm just trying to going to try to ground you in the rules here before we go over the methodology. And this is just background information, so I'm going to cover this pretty quick so we can get to the software uh, part of this thing. Uh, Martin, are there, are there any questions? Not at this time, Carlos. Okay, so for for you walks that are tracking, where are we in the security rule? We're in 164.308A1I. This is the security management process standard. You know that in the security rule you have standards and you have implementation specifications, okay? And this standard requires that an organization implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, correct security violations. You're like, what? Okay, what does that mean, right? It's like, that's a broad statement. Well, they kind of tell you what it means because they give you four implementation specifications and then the first standard, all four are required. And the first one, it's the one we're talking about today, it's a risk assessment. This is the first one you got to do. I'm going to back up. Implement, this implementation specification requires that an organization, this is talking about a risk assessment now, conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risk and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI held by the covered entity or business associate. That's what they mean by conducting a risk assessment, okay? Now, we're going to break it down into granular steps because that's what the NIST methodology does. But look at this. All four implementation specifications of that first security rule standard, they're all required. First one is a risk assessment. Second one is risk management where you actually do the work. Remember, this is a key distinction. In the risk assessment, you analyze. In the risk management, you actually do. You implement controls to reduce levels. So this is the work part. The risk management, the risk assessment is the uh, analysis step. And as you know from a couple of screens back, risk management also contains a risk assessment because it's this recursive evergreen process. And then you have your sanction policy and your activity review. And all of these are called specifications, but HHS itself has started to use the term controls. Why? Because in the rest of the the security industry, cybersecurity industry, they're not called implementation specifications, they're called controls. So even HHS has sort of modernized the way that it talks about it, but since the security rule used this terminology, we're kind of stuck with it forever. So what are the steps to conduct the risk assessment? Okay, and these come right out of the NIST methodology. Now, and we're going to show you how some of this can be streamlined, okay? But all of this is required sooner or later, but there's no mandate that you got to do every one of these steps for your first risk assessment. So you know you have to gather data. What kind of data? Your security objects, your operations, your assets, your individuals, right? Those things, security objects are things that you apply controls to your hardware, your workforce, your applications, your database, those are the things that you are trying to protect, okay? Some of them are hard physical things that you can touch. Some of them are abstractions, like a process that's an abstraction, right? Or an application to some degree that's an abstraction, okay? But it's essentially an inventory in process, okay? And then this is the hard part. If you, if you ever tried to do this without software, with spreadsheets like we attempted to do at first because it was better than nothing, you have to actually match threats, vulnerability pairs, okay? And this is where you start pulling your hair out. What's the threat? What's the vulnerability? How do I match them up, okay? You have to, you have to gather threat, vulnerability pair. And this is where Expresso has already done that heavy lifting for you. It's gathered 150 different threat, vulnerability pairs and create risk for you, right? It doesn't do the work of actually assigning the probabilities, okay, but it's gathered this for you so you're not staring at this blank sheet of paper. So threat vulnerabilities that pertain to your operational environment, which you will subsequently associate with security objects. Uh, many of these T's and V's are common to practices of all sizes, so we know that social engineering, social engineering and intrusion apply to everybody. We know that risks, threats from weather, apply to everybody. We know that, you know, a threat like a fire, a 
applies to everybody. And that's how we were able to synthesize and curate the 150 risks because we know that there's some that just apply to every environment that you can think of. Okay, once you've done that, step three is to assess your current security controls. In other words, what do you have in place that helps you reduce risk? Not eliminate risk, really, but reduce risk to the levels that are reasonable and appropriate. What do you have in place today? Because obviously, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you have something in place today that's helping you, then you're good. Okay, and then you have to determine, once you have TV pairs, the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Now, a threat can be associated with m multiple vulnerabilities, okay? So, you know, in, in, in database terms, we call that a, a one-to-many relationship. Well, it turns out that a vulnerability can also be uh, linked to multiple threats, okay? And so there's a one-to-many uh, relationship running the other way. And so essentially what you end up with is a many-to-many -many relationship, which makes things really, really complex, okay? One-to-many relationships uh, are, are sort of, you know, just standard sort of stuff. Once you start getting into many-to-many -many relationships from a database perspective, it starts getting uh, really complex really fast, okay? But a threat can be associated with multiple vulnerabilities. A vulnerability can be associated with multiple threats. Your challenge is to identify these threat vulnerability pairs. Um, like I said, Espresso, not only Espresso, but I would imagine that our competitors have tried to do some of this for you and not left, not left this blank sheet of paper. Otherwise, uh, you would be really hurting as far as how long it would take you to do this. Once you've identified threat vulnerability pairs, First of all, you need to establish the, pro the likelihood. You need to give it a probability, okay? And the probability is a subjective probability of high, medium, or low, okay? So even though we talk about this in terms of a mathematical equation, the probabilities are really set as subjective probabilities for whether this threat will exploit this particular vulnerability, okay? When it comes to the impact, if, you know, if it's catastrophic, then it's high. If it's you know not catastrophic, but maybe your your um, your patient billing system goes down, then maybe it's medium the impact to your business, or it could be low. And then once you have that, you calculate the risk level, which is you calculate the risk level as a function of TV time times I to get to R the risk. But it's all subjective; it's all high, medium, or low. And the NIST methodology blesses this approach because it knows that a mathematical approach to this is, is damn near impossible, and it's been tried, right? And if it's been tried by the people that are, you know, PhDs in math and they can't get it, then, then this understands that the world, rest of the world is never going to be able to make it happen, and you would have to have a, a data set way larger than even the biggest companies have to try to get to some sort of prob mathematical probability, okay? So, once you have the probability of a threat exploiting vulnerability, then you decide, well, what kind of impact will that have to my organization? What's the magnitude of the harm? You can include economic, reputational loss. For example, if you have no backup generator and Katrina strikes, well, then you're down. That's catastrophic for you because you can't, you can't access patient records. You can't access your scheduling system. I mean, you're pretty much out of business. Okay? Now, you could have... Um, Katrina strike, you could have Katrina strike, but you have a backup generator which kicks in, and then, you know, after a few uh, a few hours or hour or less, you're back up and running, and then, okay, yeah, that Katrina struck, and the magnitude could be catastrophic, but really, the um, it's not catastrophic because we have a control in place, we have a backup generator, so we're going to say that the the impact is, is likely to be medium, and therefore the risk is probably not high, but medium. That's the kind of uh, decisions that you go through. We don't make, Espresso doesn't make those decisions for you. All Espresso has done is gathered the threats, vulnerabilities, and impacts, and facilitated your ability to perform the analysis. And that's the important part. That's the hard thinking part. you got to go through and make those decisions. Nobody can really make that decision for you, okay? And then once you have the impact, then you calculate the level of risk. Again, it's subjective. Is it 
high, medium, or low. Okay? And then you want to document. This is what you're doing in the risk assessment step. You want to document those controls that you've identified that will mitigate the risk that you've identified to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Remember that for all intents and purposes, the risk assessment step is a, it's a documentation step. Right? It's not the doing. You're not implementing here. You're just analyzing and identifying. Okay. Any questions? We have one question at this point. What is your opinion of the need of HHS hiring a CISO? I don't think there's any requirements. In fact, I know there's not any requirements that you hire a CISO. What you need to do is, is have a, a, a security officer and a privacy officer that's obviously knowledgeable about the regulations, and if it's a security officer, knowledgeable about the kinds of things that you're going to have, the kind of mitigation steps that you're going to have to take. And so some of that involves technology. So having somebody with a CISO is actually helpful, okay? But you can imagine scenarios where there's a lot of really smart IT people that understand the regulations that, for whatever reason, haven't gotten a CISO. And as long as they understand what they're doing, they're fine. It's not about titles, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's not about titles. It's about results. What results did you produce? Did you, in the real world, did you actually take steps to reduce risks that are reasonable and appropriate? So somebody with some highfalutin title that didn't do anything, that's not going to help you, right? So the, the, the skill sets are only of use to you to the degree that they're actually helping you reduce risk and mitigate risk. That's the only one we have. Okay. Give me a second here and I'll be right back with you guys. Just give me a second. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, it gets cold in the morning in the office and then it gets warm in the afternoon. So I'm going to go through these steps in detail but really, really quick, because we want to get to software, and that's why everybody attended today. Gather data. It's really inventory. What are you gathering data of? Your operations, your business processes, and workflows, your assets, right? Things that are tangible, intangible, phones, servers, network routers, all that kind of stuff, and individuals, your workforce, right? you got to gather all that up, okay? Now, before Espresso, this is what we gave you. We gave you spreadsheets to try to do go get all that, okay? And, you know, that was no small feat to try to get that organized and, and capture all that in a spreadsheet, okay? But that that was the starting point. That's what NIST said. Now, it turns out that in Espresso, yes, we let you import security objects, you know, from your, um, if you have, have an accounting system where you have all your assets, you have your uh, HR system where you, have your, where, you, where you have all your people, as long as you put them in a particular format, CSV format, you can import them into Espresso. But, and this is a really, really big but, Espresso doesn't make you do that. It doesn't make you gather all your inventory before you can do a risk assessment. Why? Because some of these controls, most of the controls in the security rule apply to any security object you can think of. What does a disaster recovery plan apply to? It applies to all assets, all security objects, okay? Damn near all of them. What is an emergency mode, um, right, implementation control? What is it? It applies to all security objects. So the thing is, in the, the, you're not going to get an A here for having the greatest inventory. If you take and you do this as risk assessment with Espresso and you go through and you calculate these you know, what's the probability, what's the impact, and you produce this report, and you haven't imported all your security objects, but you went out into the real world and actually implemented the controls, now what do you think, if you were audited, you think you're going to get uh, willful neglect because you didn't have the best inventory imported? No. You're, you're going to be judged on results. So if, if your vendor is making you spend six months gathering inventory before you can do your first risk assessment, that's something to consider, okay, because it's not required. There's nothing in the NIST standard that requires that you do that, okay? 
You want to understand who the uh, adversary is, whether it's an individual, group, organization, government. Okay, that's just kind of information that is going to be in, implied in the threat vulnerability pair. You know, in practice, you, you're not going to say, "Oh, yeah, this is this is the Chinese. This is you know, this is uh, anonymous." You don't go through all that. Okay, the as is was taking stock of what you already have. What do you already have in place so that you don't duplicate that, right? What controls? And if you have EHR software, you know that they have passwords that you got to enter, and they may be making you use two-factor authentication, and you probably do have some sort of disaster recovery plan, hopefully. Uh, at least at a minimum, you have a backup plan. And so there's some things that you have in place that you ought to take stock of, okay? And both security controls, and technical and non-technical controls. So some of the things that you have in place are going to be processes. What kind of processes do you have in place? What kind of training processes do you have in place? What kind of incident uh, security incident reporting processes do you have in place? Okay, these are the things that you need to take stock of uh, as you go through. Now we've identified, like I said, we've uh, Espresso identifies when you think of what you got to do to comply with the security rule. Those 150 risks that we have, they identify those controls, that call them, they come out of the security rules. So at the end of the day, if you implement those, you're in, you're in uh, compliance by definition. Okay, so we take the mystery out of all this sort of nonsense about what you're doing, and we've taken that NIST specification standard and kind of rationalized it computerized it, okay, and so you're not pulling your hair out going through. Now this part, assigning the probability of P, that specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability, we make you do that because we can't make that decision for you. That's the hard work, that's the thinking that has to go on. What is the probability that this threat that we've identified for you and this vulnerability that we also identify and the threat vulnerability make up the substantive definition of a risk? What is the probability that this threat will will exploit this vulnerability? And so we use this equation as a way to abstract the entire NIST model. Okay, you got one threat that can be have multiple vulnerabilities associated with it. But notice that V1 can be associated with T2 and T1 and Tn. Okay, so you have that many-to-many -many relationship. But for each threat vulnerability pair, so here we're looking at T2 V1, you have to calculate the probability of T2 uh, exploiting V1 and, and give it a subjective value, high, medium, or low. And then you say, for the sake of argument, if that were to happen, what would be the impact to our organization? Would it be catastrophic? Would it be non-catastrophic? Okay, we let you put a bunch of impact types, but at the end of the day, you're given a value of high, medium, or low, and then you take P times I, to get to the risk level, which is also high, medium, or low. Okay, and this is the this is at the granularity level that the NIST standard recommends that you deal with it, and this is what Espresso has abstracted, and this is what you ought to be looking for in your uh, vendors that you may have already uh, purchased from or that you're looking at. Is do they assign? Do they help you with this assignment of threats, vulnerabilities, calculating probabilities? And how do they how do they actually go about doing that? Okay. Now these were examples from our spreadsheets on how you do impacts. We don't do that anymore. We do all that with uh, Expresso now. So I'm going to quickly go through this unless somebody's got a question. This is a this is a summary of the steps: gather, identify, assess, determine. So we've we've identified for you. We've identified. Uh, in the case of Espresso, threats and vulnerabilities. We've done that, okay? We've identified that you have to, at a minimum, implement all 29 of the security rule controls. We've identified them and we've tied them to multiple risks, okay? You have to go through and determine the probability of a threat. You have to go through and determine the impact. You have to go through and, and determine the level of risk. And then once you get this report, you have to say, okay, so which one of these controls, because you may not be able to implement all 29 security rule controls at one time, okay, 
which one of these controls, which set of controls, are we going to do during our first risk mitigation attempt? Because you know we only have this many resources, this much budget, this much time. There's no rule that you got to get it all done through your first risk assessment. In fact, what HHS wants uh, wants you to have is a methodology in place that allows you to get better and better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence over time. So over time, you should, you know, be making progress in that you you will eventually cover all 29 security rule controls and others that pertain to your environment. Okay? Martin, any questions? Yes, we do have one question, and I wanted to mention something to the handout for today's webinar. The, the, the slides is available in the handout section, so that will help us out there. Just go in there and get it. Is, and the question is, is it necessary to have a full-time HIPAA safety officer to deal with all of this? That's a nice way to put it. Or can this person be assigned the position and still hold another formal position within the organization? No, there's no requirement that you have a full-time person. There is a requirement that you have a knowledgeable person. And I understand that the challenge, like in small clinics and ambulatory uh, practices, there, you know, people wear, especially the office manager or somebody like that, wears multiple hats. Okay, so no, there's no requirement that you have a full-time person. There's a requirement that you have a knowledgeable person that's been given resources to, uh, to get this done. Right, and ultimately the executive team will be held accountable if they nominated somebody that's never been trained, doesn't have the resources, etc. But there's no requirement that either the privacy officer or the security officer uh, be a full-time person. There is a requirement that you have a named privacy officer and a named security officer, which means you better have somebody in your personnel file that has, as part of their title, security officer or privacy officer. Now they can have other titles, okay? But they better have these titles because these are supposed to be named positions, right? So if an auditor shows up, they're going to say, okay, I want to talk to the security officer. In my first meeting, I want to talk to the security officer. Who is that? Right? And if the, you know, if the doc has that deer in the headlights look, well, you've probably lost already, right? So uh, but yes, no, a full-time position is not, not required. Any, uh, any follow-up to that? I, I was going to ask you a question. If it's a very small practice, can the compliance officer be the security officer and the privacy officer as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. No more questions. And in many small, in many small practices, I, I would assume that that would be the case. That it would be one. And, now, and you can outsource that, though, as well. You know, it can be your IT person, could be your your business, one of your business associates, could be your privacy officer and security security officer. There's no requirement that that those positions absolutely have to be filled by somebody in your workforce. Okay. Now, here's what we talked about before. You know, if you've done no risk assessment, you're going to be in willful neglect, and you're going to get whacked hard with a, a serious fine. If there's a breach, they have to investigate you. If there's a breach of over 500. They have to investigate you. You're going to end up on the on the wall of shame. They're going to do an audit. If they find out you haven't done a risk assessment, you're really toast. You're probably looking at a million five just out of that one violation. Okay. And we talked about this. Anytime there's a major change to your operational environment, moving locations, you got to do a risk assessment. And whenever it's warranted by app applicable law. In other words, stage one meaningful use attestation required by law that you do a risk assessment in order to attest, okay? So if there's a material change in the law, that also may trigger you having to do a risk assessment. Who's responsible? Well, we just talk about that. You, the privacy officer, you, the security, security officer, and ultimately you, the workforce member. Everybody has a part to play here. Um, the compliance officer, for sure, the executive team, for sure, okay? and those last two parties are definitely going to be held to account and other parties are going to be held to account to the degree that whether or not they've been trained, how were they trained, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so really it's the entire organization. Uh, and now we're going to shift to this compare and contrast and I, I, I promise that this would not be a, uh, 
a, a commercial for espresso. So we're just going to use espresso as a, a something to compare to. Okay, and that's oh, a, the, 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 like, I was going to say I can I can uh, load espresso if you'd like. No, I didn't really want to do a demo, Deb. I didn't really want to talk about it. I just really okay. want to talk more about uh, we compare and contrast. Okay, got it. So for espresso, we take these risk vulnerability threats and we create them for you, and we create a set of 150 that you start out with, okay? And we take into consideration the fact that you have security objects that could be devices, places, persons, and we've created this tree that says, hey, device is a, a type of category, and underneath that category you have classes of stuff, servers, PCs, phones, and places, then you have built, this come out, we, we give you this hierarchy out of the box. Now, obviously we can't, we can't, we don't know your security objects, we don't know how many PCs, how many servers you have, we allow you to import them, but we give you this tree structure that you can modify to reflect how your operational environment really is in practice, okay? So we know you're going to have security objects, we just don't mandate that you have all security objects in place, or any, before you can do your first risk assessment, okay? So this is the main menu of Espresso, and as you can see, it's got the things that we've been talking about, security objects, threats, vulnerabilities, impacts, risks, assessments, controls, and reports, okay? And this is the home screen, and when you log in, you see how many risks are uncontrolled. Well, as it turns out, see here, this is what it looks like when, when uh, you load it up with Espresso. We've identified 150 risks. We've identified 29 vulnerabilities. We've identified nine threats, okay? And there's no security objects and no impacts because that's up to you. But notice, there's no uncontrolled risk because a security control has been, has been associated with each and every one of these 150 risks, and those security controls that have been associated with one or more risks are the ones that come out of the security rule. They're the 29 implementation specification control controls that you have to implement in order to comply with the security rule. So this is a basic question that you need to be asking your vendor is, Okay, yeah, this is helping me do a risk assessment. First of all, what is the methodology best based on, right? And they 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 shouldn't have a, a they shouldn't have a deer in the headlights look. If they say high trust, well, okay, but high trust does all this mapping. It's not it's not what HHS recommends. Recommends HHS recommends NIST SP 800-30 Rev 1. Okay, that's the gold standard. So you better have at least something as good as that or better. Right? And you're going to want to ask that question. What methodology did you use to come up with your approach for conducting a risk assessment? Okay. Now here are security objects. We told you that we have these categories, devices, network, operations, etc. And underneath these we have classes of stuff that we showed you in the first slide. This is for you to use however you want. But the interesting thing about security objects is that at the end of the day, you will apply, as you do more and more risk assessments, you will apply controls to these, to security objects, right? To your uh, PCs, to your routers, to your workforce, etc. And we let you apply a control, we, can, we let you say, this control applies to all security objects. This control, no, this control is just applies to devices, okay? Which means that it applies to PCs, phones, you know, pads, etc. And we'll, or we can say, no, you know what? This this control only applies to phones, or this control only applies to pads. Okay. Or at the very bottom most level, we can say, you know what? This control is so unique and important. It only applies to this one security object. Okay. So we contemplate the fact that you're going to be uh, importing security objects uh, uh, over time, right? But in many, many organizations, this is the holdup, right? And this is one of the things that we don't require is you, for you to go through that process 
because you can we, you can and our customers have uh, done risk assessments in three hours or less. And one of the reasons we can back up that advertising is we're not forcing you to gather all your security objects first, and this doesn't force you to gather them all first. Okay, because like we talked about, some some controls apply to all security objects, and moreover, what's more important? that you have this perfect inventory or that you actually took those controls that were identified during the risk assessment and went out into the real world and started implementing them. In other words, you got a control that says you ought to have a disaster recovery plan. What's more important, the fact that you associated this discovery, uh, disaster recovery plan with all these security objects or that you actually uh, developed, tested, implemented, your disaster recovery plan in the real world? Well, obviously, the answer to that is that you did it in the real world, that you mitigated, right? This is not, again, you're not going to win a, an A. This is not an academic exercise, uh, whether you're going to win an A, that you had the most perfect risk assessment, because there is no such thing as a perfect uh, risk assessment. So anybody not get not get what, a, what, uh, what we're doing here with the security objects as far as the tree and the classifications and things like that. Um, I have some quest or questions here. Why would we need the devices, et cetera, entered into the assessment? Well, the devices are because you apply security controls to it. That's the that's the answer. Devices are, in this case, it's a category. Devices actually stand have classes underneath it. Okay. And devices would mean things like um, PCs, phones, pads, routers. All those things would be considered devices, and you apply controls to devices. And you can apply it at the category level, at the class level, or at the security object level. Okay? This is not a requirement. This hierarchy is not a requirement that we force you to use. This is so that you're not staring at a blank sheet of paper. You can organize these categories and classes however you like. Okay? This is just a suggestion that Espresso ships with to help you think through what it is you're doing with your security objects. Okay? So if you're comparing software, you should know, and this is what I'm talking about. This is why Espresso <coughs> helps you climb the literacy curve. It starts to it starts to force you to answer or to ask the kinds of questions that you're asking right now. Wait a minute, what are we doing with this? Ah, okay, I get that. Yeah, we got to apply con controls. Controls, you know, or technical controls, process controls, training is a control. Those are things that you apply to people, places, names, networks, operations, blah, blah, blah. You apply those things to things in the real world to reduce levels. That's how it works. Okay. Is Expresso a cloud-based application space? Can you speak to the security of the data that one would be entering into the system? Yeah, so Expresso is cloud-based, right? So it's a SaaS software as a service. It's using Microsoft's Azure platform on the back end. The data, everything you enter in here is encrypted, okay, uh, to a level that satisfies the HHS protocol. Right, of course, we're not. We tell you in our terms of use that you shouldn't be putting PHI. You know, you shouldn't be putting patient information in Espresso. That's not. But we still encrypt it all, and we you access it over an HTTPS secure uh, connection. Okay, so we're doing everything we can. We understand that that this is uh, highly valuable um, customer information, and, and we're going to protect it. Right, so. It's a great question, does the shoemaker's kid have, have shoes? And the answer is yes, the shoemaker's kid's got shoes. Um, where is it hosted is the question now. It's hosted on the Microsoft Azure platform, which means it's hosted somewhere in the USA on a, in a data center that Microsoft controls. And that's about all that I can tell you. The rest of it is magic. That's it. It's hosted with Microsoft. 
If an office uses an external compliance officer, does HHS have to schedule with the security officer just before showing up uh, for a standard audit? Well, if you have if you have like a BA that's your security officer or privacy officer, you're going to get some notice from HHS. I don't know what ten days or whatever the notice is before they show up. And yes, they're not. HHS is not going to schedule with anybody. HHS is going to tell you we're going to be there in ten days, and you got to make sure that your security officer and privacy officer is there. They ain't gonna. They're not going to you know sync calendars with anybody. They're going to tell you we're coming. And we're coming in 10 days. Um, there's a question. Can we see an example of how to do the devices and add the controls? Well, this actually wasn't a demo of um, Espresso. I can tell you where there is a demo of Espresso, where you, where you can see that. It's, a, it's an hour long, okay? And you can... Um, and I'll just do, I usually don't like to do this, man, because stuff sometimes goes, uh, but in this case, I'm going to make an exception. If you go to um, store.hipposurvivalguide.com, okay, and you go to, um, so that's easy to remember, store.hipposurvivalguide.com. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put that into the chat of that, so I think you guys can grab it. All right, and... You go to videos. This first video is a public demo that went on for an hour. Lots of questions and answers um, around Expresso. So if you if you wanted, you know that that's what you're looking for. This is where I would start, and then you can ping us with those kinds of questions. Okay. But today's today's. Uh, presentation was really to try to get you to be grounded as to what kinds of questions you should be asking. So, you know, one of the questions is that you should be asking any vendor is how do you deal with security objects? Do you allow us to categorize them and classify them so that we can apply controls up and down the tree? Or do you allow us to import them from our other systems? How do you how do you handle that? These are the that's an important question. That you that you need in, that you need um, answers to. Okay, and then risk. How do you deal with risk? Well, here's our risk screen, and you can see this espresso risk zero zero one. This is generated. It goes from zero zero one to one hundred and fifty, but this problem risk level of high high high. That's something that Debbie did when she was you know uh, working with a demo copy because. We, out of the box, say that these things are unassigned. You're the one that has to go and say, hey, what's the probability that this threat will exploit this vulnerability? And right now, the threat vulnerability is in the screen before. In release 1.1, you're going to see it on this screen because it'll just make it easier. You get in this screen, and then you say, okay, well, what's that threat? What's that vulnerability? It's actually in the screen before, but we're going to change that in 1.1. Uh, and usually, though, it's not covered up, so our customers, we have over, we have hundreds of customers already using Espresso, so they, they haven't had uh, any problems sort of going through this. Once the light goes on, they kind of get how to do this. This is an example of a risk, okay? Here's the description. Here's the threat, weather or natural disaster. Here's the vulnerability, no disaster recovery plan. This comes out of the box. We've identified this for you, the impact is inability to access patient records. That's something that you would have put in. The responsible party is Debbie because she was logged in. Here the risk we say is high. Okay, because we why? Because we don't have any disaster recovery plan. We get hit by Katrina, we're toast. The threat vulnerability prob probability level is high, right? Is that you know if if we have what well, if, if we have a Katrina event, what is the probability that it's gonna exploit this vulnerability of no disaster recovery? recovery plan, that's high, okay, because we have no way to get back up, we don't have a plan, we don't have people, people don't know who, what, what roles they're going to play, etc. okay, so this is, again, this is, right, you're asking, you're talking to a vendor, you're going to say, well, how do you deal with risk? Do you pre-populate any of the risk? How do we go through and assign this 
uh, threat vulnerability probabilities and things like that. Okay, and we have this thing called impact types. And again, this is just to help you. This is you can name these and you can create your known. And in fact, what what do we have? That we have we have a bunch of impact types that that now we allow you to import. Correct? Yes. Yes. And that's what we're showing here, right? That we have catastrophic. We have seven minor. We have four. So you know here. You're, the idea was so that you're not starting staring at this blank sheet of paper, but the other I, I, the other design principle was you're not stuck with our impact types, just like you're not stuck with our uh, security rule hierarchy tree. You can create your own tree. You can create your own impact types. We were just trying to help you along so you could actually do a risk your first risk assessment in three hours or less. Okay. You can change this anytime you want. Here, you can create a new impact, right? Here, you can assign controls to a risk. Now, these controls, you can't tell from here, but if you were to click on this, you would see that this all of these controls are nothing more than the security rule implementation specifications, and many of them have the actual rule, like these. this first one that's checked, it says implement, sorry, I got to put my glasses back on, implement security measures sufficient to reduce risk and vulnerabilities to reasonable and appropriate levels to comply with 164.306A. That's the flexibility principle, excuse me, that comes right out of, that comes right out of uh, the security rule. The second one that's checked, implement procedures to regularly review records of information systems. These are controls. If you don't have them, then you can't be in compliance with the security rule. So a really, really basic question that you ought to be asking your vendor is, do you identify the controls that are required by the security rule? Because if you don't, although they may be helping you with other things and helping you get your environment um, you know, more Katrina-proof in other areas, they're really not helping you that much with the security rule. And at the end of the day, you have to comply with the security rule, right? So at least you want to make sure that you got that covered before you start doing more sophisticated stuff. So yeah, and in, people, this, in this case, you're, you're about to show it there too. When when you go into the controls, you actually can see where in the in the regulations there's an, an opportunity to click where you can actually see the the exact verbiage in the regulations that says this must be so. Right, so we, we, we track this, we built this w with, uh, this is what Debbie's talking about, knowing that the HIPAA Survival Guide website existed and that the HIPAA Survival Guide website contains the full source of the statute and regulations. So for a control, we actually let you click on here, 164.530, that's the training documentation requirement of the privacy rule, okay? You can click on that and go to the HIPAA Survival Guide website and get the full source related to that control, right? The actual regulation. And underneath that, we're giving you additional, we're giving you additional um, resources. This PR, AR2, that's, that's to our security rule checklist, privacy rule checklist, I'm sorry, PR is a privacy rule checklist, administrative requirements, the second checklist item, workforce training, blah, blah, blah. So you could go then and look at our privacy rule checklist find that checklist item and say, okay, okay, I get it. I see how that relates to this training control that we're talking about here. Okay, and yeah. so. And, and that actually and that actually hits both sides of what, what we're providing, and that is the assessment step one and, this, and the mitigation step two, because the privacy rule item that you just showed, the checklist, provides an opportunity for mitigation of that particular regulation. Right, so Debbie brings out a key point that you're going to be one, wanting to ask your vendor is, okay, you help me with the risk assessment, but then how do you help me with risk mitigation, right? This is an analysis step, so the way we split it is, so our subscription plan costs twenty four ninety five with Espresso, but then we have, we have Espresso, you get Espresso, but then we have these 30 other products that help you mitigate policies, procedures, checklists, frameworks, all those things help you mitigate. So, if, you know, we like to say if we, you give us 15 minutes of your time, 
we can show you how far out of compliance you are. If you give us another 15 minutes, we can show you how far in compliance you could be if you bought our product because we not only help you with the analysis step, we help you with the mitigation step. We get you further down the road. Now, again, right? I, I don't want this to be just a commercial on express show. What when you're buying risk assessment software, you ought to be asking the question to a vendor, okay, I get it. You you got these features for a risk assessment. How do you actually help me mitigate? Okay, because at the end of the day, having a risk assessment, if you didn't do any mitigation, you're going to still be in willful neglect, right? If you didn't actually go do your disaster recovery plan or your emergency plan or, you know, your roles and responsibility, if you didn't go do those things, you don't have any policies and procedures in place. You identified that you needed them, but you don't have them in place, you're still in willful neglect, right? A, an analysis step without mitigation is, is, you know, yes, it's important. You won't get... You won't get willful neglect because you don't have a risk analysis. You do. But the real action, the real work is in the mitigation step. So you ought to be asking, how do you help me mitigate? And what does that cost me? Is that a separate cost? Is that built in? Et cetera. Okay? Martin, you, you look like you were going to jump in here. No, I, I don't have anything that at this time. I was typing some things. Okay. So, of course, oh, you want to be able minute. to report out. How? As soon as, as soon as I said that, how often are your documents updated as new regulations and guidance comes out? So we document every time. That's what you get with the subscription, right? When the omnibus rule came out, we've already, guys, we've been doing this for since 2010, okay? So when the omnibus rule came out, we had to go modify all our products. The omnibus rule is not a rule by itself. It touched the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, the enforcement rule. Right, we had to go update all our products and the Hippos Private Guide website to reflect the new law. Right, so we're in the business of keeping this up to date. That's one of the things that you get with the subscription plan. Right, we keep it up to date. We have to keep it up to date. Right, and that's why you know if you that's why it's twenty four ninety five the first year. The optional years, the renewal years are twelve ninety five. Right, that's part of what you're getting. But you're getting two things, right? You're getting continued access to Espresso because you're not going to just do one risk assessment set and forget. That ain't the way it works, okay? You're probably going to be doing at least one a year, if not three or four, and Espresso lets you do as many risk assessments as you care to do, and it keeps the history of all of them. So you could go back in time and say, you know what, if an auditor came in, I want to go back and look at that risk assessment that we did in 2014. Now, that's another question you ought to be asking your vendor. Do you keep historical copies of risk assessments? Because you may want to, if you had an incident that involved data that was just 2014 data, well, you're going to want to go back to in, in time. If you can't go back in time and look at a historical risk assessment, well, then you, you kind of got a problem, right? So that's another question that you want to ask. Can you produce those kind of reports? So the net-net, the deliverable out of the risk assessment is the master risk assessment report that identifies the risks, the threats, vulnerabilities, and the controls that you need to implement, right? That's what our users, once they finally get it, they say, oh, I got it, and here's my risk assessment report, and this is what I can show to an auditor. I'm like, yeah, that's what you can show to an auditor, so you, you, that you accomplish that step, and now you've got to get busy mitigating, right? So you can show, so that you can show visible demonstrable evidence for each one of those requirements, right? And so we have that visible demonstrable evidence or we provide a roadmap in our privacy rule checklist. That contains every single requirement in the privacy rule, all of them. And for each one of them, it says, this should be your policy, these should be the processes that you implement that underpin this policy, and then here's how you ought to go about tracking process results, right? If you have all three of those for each requirement, you have policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms for process results, then you have visible demonstrable evidence of compliance at the granularity level of a requirement. Now, if you've got a vendor that doesn't understand what the requirements are, then I don't know what they're helping you comply with. Okay? Some abstract notion of HIPAA? No. You can't, and this isn't just HIPAA, any regulatory regime that you can think of, you have to comply at the granularity level of a requirement. If you're not complying at that level, then you're not complying by definition. Okay, so we allow you 
you'd produce the reports that you would have to show. Here's an example of the master report. You see the risk, the threat, the vulnerability, the impact here was unassigned, the probability, the impact, et cetera, right? This is the output of your first risk assessment that you can do in three hours or less. Okay, we allow you to import security objects, uh, what I think risks, security objects, impacts. I don't know if we allow you to implement con uh, import controls uh, right now, but, uh, and then of course you can print all these things, so you can print reports of what are all my risks, what are all my threats, what are all my vulnerabilities, etc. You can also search for stuff. You can imagine if you have thousands of security objects that are going to be difficult to find. We got standard built-in search features that you would see in something like QuickBooks that allow you to find stuff really, really fast. Um, and that's it. Hopefully you have a, 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 at least some idea of the kind of questions you should be asking uh, any vendor that wants to sell you a risk assessment. What, what it does, what's the methodology, um, after the fact, how do you help me remediate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And before we do this shameless plug, Mark, I'm going to throw it out one more time to see if, it's, uh, to see if there's any questions. Uh, not at this time. All right, so here's the plug, right? We do the subscription plan, first year for $24.95. You get all our products. When you go out to our store, every single product that you see, you get as part of the $24.95, including Espresso, obviously, right? If you want to renew, then it's $12.95. And what you get with renewal is you get continued access to our products. You get new products. For example, we just last week released a certification program. 15 training modules, 220 questions. We will issue you a certification. If you take all those courses and you get and you make a passing grade of 70, we will we will give you a HIPAA certified professional certification that we issue. Okay? If you want to buy that standalone, that's $795. But if you want to buy if you want to buy the subscription plan, you just get it as part of the subscription plan, okay? Uh, we had two model letters, a, a model letter for tracking um, PHI amendments and a model letter for tracking PHI disclosures that we updated the privacy rule checklist with last week. We're working on a template for a disaster recovery plan and each time we add one of these products, you just get it as part of your subscription. Okay, so that's part of why we think you're going to want to renew because, first of all, if there's any changes to the law, we're going to reflect those changes and we're going to continue to add new products that add value to your subscription. So we believe we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients. Primarily, we provide educational products that you can start executing on day one. That's what we do. We teach, we teach, we teach. I've, been, I've taught thousands of people by now on, on these free webinars that we do every month. It's in the, literally in the thousands. All that training has gone into our products, uh, and so you benefit from that. We use Agile compliance, and we develop our products that way. It's agnostic, our, 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 our products are agnostic, whether you're a business associate or covered entity. It doesn't matter whether you're a subcontractor of a business associate. It doesn't matter where you're, whether you're a little ambulatory practice or a hospital. We got clients that are both. Okay, whether you're lawyers or CPAs, we got clients that are both. Okay, and so we're agnostic to size. You know, all of that stuff. All of those organizations can benefit. We believe that what we ship is wetware, right? Educational wetware is is that tacit knowledge that you get into your head by using our products, okay? It's educational wear, wetware instead of just software. We believe really that with Espresso, there are no substitutes out there. Uh, there are actually competing products, but at this price point, there are no substitutes, so sh you should accept no substitutes. And I'm going to one more time throw it out there for Q&A. Um, nothing at this time. Very quiet. Happy Thanksgiving. And thank you.
This is what, what, yeah, thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening. You got the slides right there. You should be able to get them in the handouts if you can. Just send an email to support at threelinespublishing.com and we will get you uh, the slides and we will uh, see you next time. Next uh, webinar will be on December 15th and we're going to talk about HIPAA and social engineering and phishing schemes. So oh, one have last, a happy Thanksgiving. One last but, question. Do you also perform HIPAA assessments? Okay, that's a great question. So, you know, Three Lions Publishing is not a law firm. So, by definition, it, it is prohibited from engaging in the practice of law. It's illegal for Three Lions to give legal advice. But my law firm, Digital Business Law Group, has uh, an offering. I can give you legal advice because I'm an attorney. And we have an offering called the Jump Start, which for $2,500, and we've had uh, one client and lots of clients that are now expressing interest in that, is that we will walk you through. We give you, um, I believe it's 120 hours for, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the, and I'm going to give you the URL. We give you 120 hours. 20 hours of legal consulting for this HIPAA jumpstart and basically it assumes that you bought the Expresso subscription plan and then we just walk you through how to, you know, because people get all these products and they say, great, I love all this content, I got all these products, I'm ready to go, what do I do now? So, you know, that's a, that's a common, that's a common question, right? Well, this is a $2,500 fixed fee offering. And we will get you up the curve really quick. So if you're looking at some consultant that's saying, "Oh yeah, I'll do that for twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars," right? And you buy our subscription plan for twenty-five hundred dollars, and you spend another twenty-five hundred dollars with my law firm, then we'll get you most of the way there. And people love people love this thing because it gets them oriented. It's legal advice, so we can tell you whether or not if you do this, you're in compliance, you're not in compliance. Um, obviously, we also have a more sophisticated uh, offering. My law firm does. We come in and do an audit, but I got to tell you, that's a $25,000 fixed fee. I believe most of uh, most of you guys would need the ones that look. The majority of our customers have found out how to do it DIY, do it themselves. They've actually figured out, you know, our products are that clear, right, and we provide that much of a roadmap that most of our clients have figured out how to do it themselves, but if you need some hand-holding, this is probably the vehicle that's most economical for you. Martin, is that, is that it? That, that's pretty, pretty much everything that's on there. All right, guys, thank you for uh, listening. Have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll be back with uh, another webinar on 1215, it'll be HIPAA and social engineering uh, fishing schemes. Well, one thing Thank I did want to one thing I wanted to point out is uh, that you made a mistake. It's not 120 hours; it's 20 hours for the fixed fee package for the jump start. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was short myself. I was thinking, wow, that sounds like too many. I was, I was thinking it was a great deal, actually. Well, well I thought it, it was is. a good deal too, but well, let me let me say this. Look, if you do twenty five hundred and you divide it by twenty, that's hundred and twenty five dollars an hour. I can tell you that you're not going to get any legal advice for hundred and twenty five dollars an hour, right? My base rate is way more than hundred and twenty five dollars an hour. So we, you know, so we're trying to give you a lot of value, legal value. Now, now you got lawyers that can actually give you legal advice as to whether or not you're in compliance. It's a whole different deal. And so we've, we've done that as a fixed fee because we know a lot of people have a need to, to get jump started and we want to deliver value. I um, want you to love Espresso and climb the curve as fast as you can. That's okay. it. See you guys next time. Thank you for listening. God bless.